I'm just going to report on research um, that I was part of in the University of Limerick with uh, Professor Richard Moles. Um, the, work base, the work basically revolves around, it's far from modelling really, it's the other end, it's actual consumption, doorstep to doorstep throughout communities. We picked a community in Tipperary, the community was Ballina. Um, my brief, a brief background is I've worked with a lot of communities, as the tractor said uh, in the introduction. Uh, the Energy Agency has a number of community-based projects which I've worked, worked on. And the last one there, the Surf Community, is the subject of this conference. Um, what I might do is just show a small movie which describes uh, in about three minutes the a project that I will discuss and it'll do a lot of explaining for me. So over the last three years, a comprehensive campaign by the pupils of a North Tipperary primary school has helped reduce the carbon emissions of their town by a substantial 15%. And the children's unique achievement has even been recognized by the United Nations Environment Programme. Mary Malone has a full story. The town of Ballina has tripled in population in recent years. The extent of its carbon emissions, however, have been limited by the efforts of the children of its local national school in what's believed to be the first programme of its kind in the world. Well, we're here, as you can see, at the Green School Committee meeting, and we have one about every month or so. And these children are drawn from class, from second class up to sixth class, with representatives from each one. Now, they are the ones that spearhead the ecological footprint. The project is backed by funding from North Tipperary County Council. The children deliver some 1,000 questionnaires to every household in the parish. Families are asked detailed questions about waste management and water, fuel and transport use. The questionnaires are returned to collection points at local shops and in the school. The children are more aware and we run it in conjunction then with our own Tashka green flag mm -hmm. and we see people like children are walking to school making an effort to walk to school in the school last year we turned down the thermostat one degree and everyone was aware of why we were doing it and people have done it in their homes as well and we, we're getting very good feedback from the parents about it as well so that, that we're getting the message across and that, that's our aim. I enjoy doing it and it's good to know I'm helping the environment. I think it's very good and that people in the future will have a nice environment and it won't be polluted. What we need to do, lads, is work out the carbon dioxide emissions. This is the first time this project has been done in any, in, in any school in the world before and we have it done for three years in a row. No school has worked out the carbon dioxide emissions of its community and uh, through working that out we appoint the responsibility to the residents so they know they're using the carbon dioxide and they're very, very aware of it. The comprehensive survey and analysis is given scientific validity by a link-up with the University of Limerick. We have a group in the University of Limerick called the Centre for Environmental Research who have helped with the project and help us progress. We've built um, a watertight, accurate uh, ecological footprint methodology within CR and uh, we're using it in this community to assess the survey forms. So the completed survey form comes back, we look at the, the, the answers and we transform that into data, we collate it, and we give that information back to the community. The results are distributed in newsletter form. One of the case studies focused on the Melanthi Webster family. Well, I have two boys in Bellinan National School and two who have come through. So they're all very environmentally aware because of the Green Schools program. And with their encouragement, we've tried to reduce our carbon footprint. And we have done this through installing a zoned heating system where we only heat the portion of the house where we're using. We have re-insulated the attic and the roof spaces. We turn the thermostats for the heating to 20 degrees. And I try to wash at 30 degrees. And wherever possible, we recycle as much as we can. Over the three years of the project, the carbon emissions of the average Ballina resident has dropped by an impressive 15%, a unique achievement recognized at the highest international level. 
Well, we were very excited because the United Nations and Environmental Programme have decided to award but it's over 20 children now with a diplomas before they've even finished national school. We're very thankful to UNA for, for coming in and it's actually a diploma in ecological footprinting that the children have achieved. And you know that your grandchildren and their children and all that will have a nice life and that the world won't be ruined and it won't, like rubbish, won't be all over the ground. They won't be sleeping in cans of coke. I'll leave the last word to my son. Um, uh, so I was a parent, I was working on energy management in the University of Ulster and I was asked by the local school to join in to a campaign and uh, to design a campaign Deirdre Cox um, provided funding, she asked for a substantial environmental programme for Ballina. So we went to the University of Limerick and we looked at trying to develop a, a kind of a research plan we needed a tangible construct. We needed something that would show people what they were using, consuming, what their environmental impact was. A lot of the discussions here have been surrounding direct energy use within households, and that's, that's, that's fantastic. We also look, wanted to look at waste assimilation, the waste we use that goes to landfill that's recycled. We wanted to look at our food habits. Having footprinted 85 communities in Ireland, the average for food consumption, about a third of our impact in this room is down to the food we eat at home. Approximately a quarter is down to energy use. So we were looking at a whole range of things like water use, waste, transport, whether that was air flights for holidays or domestic uh, transport, bus, train, car. So we needed a measurement tool that was understandable to the community. We needed to incorporate a tier of behaviour analysis it's okay saying you're using, you know, uh, 25,000 kilowatt hours to your neighbour uh, in terms of your household energy use, but 25,000 kilowatt hours doesn't mean a whole lot to them. We need to carry out measurement over an extended period of time because an awful lot of community-based projects are just annual. They last for one year, they get one year of funding and that's it. But Deirdre Cox in her infinite wisdom supported us through the years. After each survey to develop a low-carbon action campaign was the, next, was the next bullet point. So we measured within each household by dropping the leaflets, by calling to the households, by the survey forms, by getting the, the data on water use, waste use, food use, transport use and household energy use. We did that each year and we did it for four years. We used an ecological footprint, you'll have heard it in the video. Uh, the reason we used an ecological footprint, there's a number of things listed there, but it's a tangible construct, it's very understandable. People talk about kilowatt hours, people talk about emissions in tonnes, people talk about all kinds of things that matter at the engineering and scientific levels. These don't matter on the street. They do, they're not understandable in general. So we looked at an ecological footprint because I can say, for instance, everyone in the world lived as we did in Ballina, if everyone in the world lived as we did in Ballina this particular year, not this year, but the first year we did it, we'd need three planets to absorb our emissions. So I could use a construct. Those number of planets came down to 1.7 at the end of the project. So you have a construct, a communication, effective communication is important for these projects and the ecological footprint for all these reasons allowed us that. One other part about this is that an awful lot of the work we're discussing is our views of communities from the outside in. My particular work was from the inside out because my son and my daughter asked me to get involved in the local green schools and luckily Deirdre Cox asked, she said we have funding, could you design a project in relation to energy and then now I'm here talking to you guys so it happened like that, but one particular researcher years ago, Arnstein, um, has, has, really, uh, has really put his finger on it. An awful lot of what government do, does or acts in is tokenism. We have placation, we have consultation. This is what we're going to do, we'll have a community meeting. Do you like it? That's the sort of, that's the sort of leadership we get sometimes. So what he talks about is delegated power, partnership and citizen control. And just to come back to that, I was asked to help out. I didn't go to the school and say, hey, I've got a great idea. 
Basically, uh, you can see a five-step phase, every five phases every year. We had contact and preparation with the community. We surveyed the community each particular year. There's an ecological footprint evaluation and formulation of the low carbon remedies. So we had little carbon workshops throughout the community. I might say at this stage, the school weren't the only community stakeholder that we engaged. There were many, the local family resource center, the, uh, the local churches. Oh, there was an awful lot of stakeholders in the community that went for the project. RTE decided to come and cover one side of the story and it was the, 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 uh, the effect, the, local, the, the collective action of this community, which I'm about to show you, was put down to the school's effect. It was, it was a big effect, but it wasn't the only effect. There were a lot of stakeholders involved and engaged. So then there was dissemination to the school of the footprint results. After the low carbon workshops, after we found out the first particular year, for instance, Balanaz and a gas pipeline. So why would it use large amounts of coal? These were things that come out of the ecological footprint that we just couldn't put our finger on. We tackled that and coal consumption came down by 65% over the four years. We, we, we would have hit, hit, hit on coal consumption for that reason, Balana being on the gas pipeline, gas being such a, a, a more efficient fuel in terms of its carbon intensity. So that dissemination was put back through the school those low carbon findings, the ecological footprint values, and then there was dissemination to the community through the school and the local stakeholders. So if you look at the five year period of time that the research took place over, you'll see that in year one, there was a survey in March. And then there was the low carbon intervention through the school and the community in July and December. July to December. Then in year two, the same thing happened. In year three, the same thing happened. In year four, the same thing happened. Measure, intervene. Measure, include, intervene. And then we had results and analysis over far right. And at the very end, there was a final behavioral survey, which the last couple of slides will address. And you'll see the sort of level of engagement and change of mindsets. And on mindsets, an awful lot of what we've been discussing are technological or structural solutions to our problems. They haven't worked. We've been talking about efficiency gains since technology was first invented, since the start of the Industrial Revolu Revolution. Emissions are on a rise in this country overall when you take waste, food, energy, and you take all of our impacts into account. Yes, the recession may have had an effect, because there's less pounds in our pockets, but overall, those are effects. And there's, a, there's, a, there's an academic argument, it's called Jevons' paradox, where if you save money in your house and, you know, laudable as, as structural changes and efficiency changes are in renewable energy, if you save money because you've insulated your attic, you just might go on an extra flight this year and burn that saving in terms of emissions. And Jevons' paradox, Jevons is basically saying we have to look at behavior. We have to change mindsets, attitudes, and beliefs early on, not just structural changes. And that's why the school was such a pivotal part of this project, because they're early, early believers. Um, the minds are being made up between the ages of seven and 11. And that's the perfect age to work with primary schools. Just to come back to Balana, it has a population of 1,861 people and 700 homes. That's a, a small outline of what Balana looks like. It's a, that's your ribbon development. Um, we had to build up a way of engaging the communities, working with the University of Limerick. I uh, became part of a research team there. Uh, this is a completely organic path. It happened. We built up a 78, uh, 78 factors, which would, uh, and worldwide, but a specific, it, it, it's, it's very useful in Ireland. 78 listed factors that Irish communities could use, uh, they could pay attention to. On, if, if they're about to undergo a low carbon transition, whether that's on energy or waste or whatever the issues are. Some of these are listed here, uh, and I'll go through a small, a small experiment with you in a minute. It's painless enough, um, so don't worry. This particular, we isolated 17 drivers. So the measurement, the ecological footprint, it's very important to have a, an, effective, an effective measurement, not kilowatt hours, you know. And you'll see an awful lot of energy advice being given in percentages. 30% of this is this. You know, if you insulate your attic, you'll save 30% of the energy. P percentages are learned in school after fractions. 
There's an awful lot of early leavers from school. We need to start thinking about wh who we're communicating with and drop the percentages. So these sort of learnings that we got from the literature and best practice, we put back into this project. But fractions are the way to go if you want to be a communicator, not percentages. And any national school teacher will tell you that. Um, feedback is important. So the project was four years long. We took measurement, we intervened, and then we had another measurement. So we, we kept feeding back into the community. Social capital is very important, engaging the community and participation. The normative consequences I'll cover in a second. There are infrastructural. Sometimes it can be very difficult, very, very difficult to reduce your carbon intensity, especially if the bus frequency isn't very good and your local train station is six miles away. So if you have to travel to Nina or Limerick, and largely Ballina would be a dormitory town of both Limerick and Nina, I suppose, um, you just have to get into the car. Information is an important part. Effective communication. And this is a short enough presentation, so I can't, I can't hit the 78 factors. Commitment is a strong one, so through pledges or mandates, locally established commitments by signature, in places that are uh, regularly, the regularly prompt people, uh, are very strong ways of reminding and sort of engaging low carbon behavior. There was 13 actors that we isolated, and this was from a six-year trawl of the academic uh, media and from various case studies across the world. There was always a commonality. There were 17 drivers that were common. There was 13 actors. So religious groups were actually quite important, and the churches in Ballina proved that. Um, they were, they were a, a, a strong part of the project. The energy and environmental champions, which you saw there, the teacher in the school, she was one of them. She was a green school teacher that was very committed to low carbon transition. And Deirdre Cox would have been another to the local authority. Um, the project manager, probably myself and the, um, the, my supervisors in the university, our, the, our research team. The school obviously was, the higher education institutes um, often, Tipperary Institute does a lot of good work in, in relation to communities. We heard John speak, John Fogley speak this morning about going to TI and doing a renewable energy course. The trust that's placed in higher education institutes from, by communities, it's, 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 it's a strong, they're a strong actor. And then other non-profit organizations. And there was 30 communication channels, but overall there's 78. I'm gonna leave my email at the end of this. If anybody wants um, a copy of the thesis or the report, if anyone wants to look at the 78 factors, there's no, I, I'll send it on to whoever emails me. Basically, can you imagine yourself in a room and you've agreed to uh, participate in this experiment and you're asked to place, you, you, you sit at a table and there's five people at that table. In some cases there were six, but there's five people at the table. You're the fourth person. You're the fourth person in the list. You will not get to say what you think the answer is until number four. There'll be a first person, a second person to say it first, a third and fourth. Because I'm going to ask the question, which line is the same length as X? Would somebody like to hazard a guess? Which line is the same length as X? E. Thank you. Um, usually there's a stony silence. You know? <laughs> trying to prompt it. B is correct, and 99% of people agreed in tests. Now, if I was to do the same thing again, but this time the other four people in your group said C. So I ask, what line is the same length as X? And person A, or person one, I should say, not to confuse this, says, oh, it's C. Person two says it's C. And you're looking at them thinking, no. person three says it's C. How many people in the room would say C? Would you put your hand up? How many people think in the room that say C? Nobody. Well, in tests, 75% of people say C. So the people that come before you, that surround you, your neighbors, your colleagues, they place a huge impact on you. And that's just one of the 78 factors that we have to look at if we're going to bring communities on a low carbon transition. The researcher wrote the fact that reasonably intelligent and well-meaning people are willing to call white black is a matter of concern. So we have to integrate drivers like societal norms and the other 78 fact, 77 factors I mentioned. Some more research just on those uh, briefly is uh, here, Cialdini placed flyers on every car, on a windshield in a library, parking lot, um, and then looked at the effect of that after 
you know, people subsequently on return to their cars, the participants were given the opportunity to scatter the flyer into a previously clean or fully literate environment. So you come back from the library and you'd, you'd be in a different environment depending. But you can see from the graph here that in the literate environment on the right, the high norm salience where someone got, as you walked, as you, walk, as you came to your car, there was a, a flyer on the windscreen. And you looked at that, but someone just passed you and threw a flyer on the ground as they walked past you in this little experiment. In that case, 54% of people littered. They got the flyer off the car and they threw it on the ground. In the other case where the model walked by, the, the, your work colleague worked by and didn't litter, just walked by the car, 32% of people took that off the window and littered. So, so many much more of them put it in their pocket or bought it into the car. Interestingly, on the far left, where you have uh, the clean environment, where the car park isn't, is not covered in litter, and a model walks past you and litters, that's the least case. So it, it shows, shows that these normative things that are done around us are quite complex, and we need to take account of them. Hot hotels are a, a point in case. They don't take any notice of this sort of uh, information, and Goldstein has proved this. In the case of using a little, do you know this in the bathroom, you reuse your towel thing. Uh, put your towel up there and it'll be fine and you can use it tomorrow if you're staying here. You know that, you know that little, little thing in the door handle? Well, in this particular case, 35% of people go into that reuse mode and say, yeah, that's grand. Now, a hotel is a fairly, in, it's a fairly enclosed, a hotel bedroom is, and the shower, of course, fairly enclosed little laboratory there, you know. You're making a decision more or less on your own. I'll put the towel up. 35% of people do. And that's the industrial that's the, that's the accepted norm across hotels. They use the environmental message. So save the planet and put your little towel on the thing when you're finished. Fantastic. Just 35% of people responded. But if the message said, the people who use this room or this floor in this hotel are exceptionally you know, environmentally minded and always put the towel up, that shot up to 44%. And if anyone is managing energy or managing waste, there's a massive change. And the, the, the accepted norm in hotels is, stick, stick, is still to stick with the save the planet message. So the normative, these normative things are very important. So before I go into some of the graphs, um, just to show the trends in the community over the four years, five years, um, you need to broadcast those subject, subject, subjective norms. They need to be visible. Conformity is a good way through mandates or petitions. Case studies are brilliant. Sort of thing that's coming out of serve are fantastic. If you know your neighbour has done something, you're far more likely to do it than if I tell you to do it. They are absolutely a wonderful way to help people change. Rewards and competitions are effective as well. We have to ac uh, activate personal norms through measurement at the doorstep. It's very interesting that smart metering in general and that technological fix in terms of low carbon transition hasn't really performed. Any of you have looked at the American figures, the UK figures, or the ESB figures, the papers that have come out, those three papers, they don't show huge changes in those households that had smart meters. You're talking about changes between half a percent and three or four percent, max. People with a smart meter don't save a whole lot more energy. You need to activate the personal norm. Someone has to be responsible for what they consume or if you want behaviour to change or help, then you need, to, you need to get a scription of responsibility. So by filling out a survey, talking to someone, or visiting them and talking to them about the readings on the smart meter, making it hugely, creating a situation where they understand fully that they're now using less or, losing mo or using more. So effective communication is a big part. One thing before I go on to those as well, is spillover behaviour is very important. Okay, I'm running out of time. Spillover behaviour is something whereby if someone wants to save energy, they'll do it in a number of ways. They'll also reduce waste, they'll also recycle, they'll also drive less. So we need to look at a whole load of low carbon behaviours, not just saving energy. So school, some of the, uh, some of the stakeholders in the school, Green School Committee. Household energy use per person dropped by 36% in four years. The H bars here the error bars show 95% confidence intervals because of the outliers. 
In the first year there, 2004, 2005, one man in his household, living beside a house, as, as Mark so eloquently spoke about all these different energy uses, used 3,000 3, litres of oil in his one house on his own. House next door, four people in it, used 1,250 litres. It's like an eightfold difference. His consumption is eight horizontal, eight verticals off this. It's, it's out the roof of the hotel. So I can't, I can't draw that. And if I do, it makes my transition look very small. So I can't do that. So I, ha I have to bring it down to 95% confidence intervals. It's not that I'm focusing on them, but I just want to show the trend. There are outliers, massively. What's interesting is the convergence of behavior from year one to year four. People get closer to a norm. Here we have oil, oil consumption reduced by 45% over the four years. Here we have coal by, six, I think it was 60, 63%. You have various other, I'm, I'm running out of time, with pipe gas and various other things there. Interestingly, pipe gas increases. Um, total waste footprint, first two years didn't do a whole lot, dropped. Uh, landfill waste dropped steadily enough. Recycled waste was the issue. It went up in the second year. Um, and we had to address that, because recycling isn't as good as prevention, for instance. So car transport, you can see the miles traveled and the, and the emissions has reduced over the four years. Bus use, train use, uh, are, are, they shoot up from a low base, uh, as does walking and cycling. Um, the food footprint was a control. It's the one thing that we didn't intervene with in a low carbon way. Changes by something like half a percent. It's not a, it's not a significant change over the four years. You'll notice that the zero point here is 0 0.9. It's just to show that the, 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 the lack of change. This is the slide. If you just take a look at this, we have a footprint in Ballina of 3.77 in the first year. The area reduces to 3.64 in the second year, to 3.26, the blue area, in year three, and to 2.72 global hectares in year four. And if we just take a quick look and I go back, home energy use is about 0.96 global hectares, the top axis in year one. Year two, it's reduced into 0.9 year three to point eight, and year four. You can see each of the, if you look at waste far right, you see waste come down from about one global hectare. Oh, actually, it, changed, it, it stayed more or less the same for the second year. Third year, it dropped, and year four, fourth again. You can see food doesn't really change. It was the control. So you can see by that blue area, and it's just what I like to get across to audiences, that this is the average ecological footprint of a Ballina person, this blue area. This is how we bought them on a low carbon transition. There are various behavioural findings that I probably don't have the time to go into. So um, I'll just finish by saying that over more than nine in every 10 people interviewed afterwards said that their knowledge had changed with respect to emissions. More than nine in 10 people said their attitudes had changed with respect to the same. Their perceptions had changed and their motivations had changed. Currently Ballina is about to trade its emissions. Over the four years, we reduced its 4,890 tonnes of emissions reductions over the four years. It, it stacks up when you're dealing with lots of people. Two tonnes here, two tonnes there. There's a 28% reduction overall. And as an ISO, we spoke about the ISO procedures. 14064 allows carbon auditing of communities. And we're now about to trade those emissions. The last community which did so, no company which did so, on a voluntary market got six euros and 20 cent for the uh, per tonne. So there's a cash cow here of approximately 30,000 euro for the community should their emissions sell on the market. If anybody wants a copy of the research on my thesis, those are my email addresses there. And the, if that, that particular research was funded by ERCSET and, um, and, and, if, and some other funders like the North Tipperary County Council, to whom I'm very grateful. Thanks.